so here from Calgary, I'm wishing you all a very snowy, very lovely um, evening wherever you are on this Tuesday. Uh, for those of you who don't know me yet, my name is Rachel Martins. I will be your co-host for this evening. With me, as always, is my partner in crime, uh, Dr. Hanga Posniak. And together we have um, this regular monthly event that we have called Luke's Legacy Family Research Rounds. And this was actually created uh, based on the memory of my son who passed away in 2020, who was asserted the notion that um, he needed a seat at the table when it came to any sort of decisions that were being made. It was just a natural function. And we want to make sure that this event reflects that same value as well too, that everybody who comes to these events is a colleague and that we can have conversations about it um, and about all the details that come with the research that very often applies to the lives that we all lead. Uh, I wanted to also offer uh, mention as well too that this evening we do have after the session an optional social time for an extra half hour. So that would be on, on the next hour uh, where it is an optional opportunity to just sit and digest what we learn uh, during these awesome research rounds. Um, this is a space for people to kind of talk about this at a greater length, and it is entirely optional. You do not need to stick around for it, but we would love to see you there if you have the time. And now I'd just like to take an opportunity to um, introduce Natalie Wright, whom is the daughter of someone who is just joining us this evening, which is Donna Thompson, who is a teacher with our, or an instructor with our family engagement and research course. And Donna's been a good friend for several years now. And it's been a pleasure to get to know you, Natalie. Now I will let you have the microphone. Thank you for being here. We appreciate you taking the time to share with us your all of your hard work. Yeah, uh, no problem. This is um, a really exciting opportunity. Thank you so much, Maria and Kinga. Um, I will just share my screen now and make sure that all of the tech works. Okay, can you all see what yes. I see? My slide. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, so the title of my talk this evening is Functional, Adaptive, Accessible, A Brief History of Post-Work Clothing and Disability. And I just wanted to start with um, an introduction to me. <laughs> uh, I am a historian. So most of my work takes place in archives and um, museum collections. I'm uh, what's called a design historian um, or material culture scholar, which means that I use um, objects primarily, um, such as clothing in the case of this talk or um, ceramics, textiles, um, furniture, you know, three, three dimensional, um, pieces of, of used goods. Um, I use those as my um, historical sources, just the way an art historian would use a painting or a photograph um, or a sculpture uh, or the way that a traditional historian would, would use um, written documents. Um, but often when I tell people that my uh, dissertation is on accessible clothing and the history of accessible clothing they tend to assume that I am a designer myself or a maker, um, which I'm not, uh, or they tend to think that I study only contemporary clothing designs, really from the past um, kind of 20 or 30 years. Um, and I think that that assumption is based around the fact that the history that we're going to discuss today is not widely known. Um, so even though I'm not creating new accessible designs, I really believe that uncovering the history of past designs will change the conversations um, that we have around uh, contemporary examples. These current conversations tend to celebrate the novelty of any accessible designs, despite the fact that um, many of the 
um, accessibility features have existed before, which we'll see um, in this presentation. Um, and uh, believing that these designs are neutral without any kind of ideological underpinnings. So um, my goal for today is to show you the key sources that I've been working with um, as I work towards uh, researching and writing my dissertation. Um, and uh, the particular features that were deemed um, accessible um, or adaptive or functional um, for uh, disabled people um, in post-war America. Um, and I should say too, just a little bit about where I'm based. I, I realize I skipped over that part, but I'm a, a PhD student at um, the University of Wisconsin-Madison. So I'm um, based here in the United States in the design history department. And I've worked in museums, um, both in the US and in Canada. So um, the outline for my talk, uh, I'll be introducing um, something called the functional fashions line. And then I'll be um, discussing the role of home economics departments um, in accessible clothing designs, and then showing you some areas for further study, um, and then opening up for, for discussion. So um, in 1958, the clothing designer Helen Cookman pictured um, here at the front of the room of the photograph, she's the one who's um, just fixing the, the garment on the young woman um, at the front of the image. Um, she displayed a pilot collection of what she called functional fashions to press at New York University's Institute for Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation. She um, is standing next to Dr. Howard Rusk in this image, who was at the forefront of the rehabilitation profession in the United States and who ran the Institute. It was Rusk who invited Cookman to come to the Institute for a three-year research residency um, in order to develop accessible clothing, which he saw as a major barrier to his goal of putting disabled Americans back to work. This goal started with veterans returning from the war uh, as Rusk served as a doctor during World War II, but he wanted to extend that goal of productivity to American civilians. This being the case, um, this picture isn't totally representative of the line's demographic, as we see a young girl as the focus of the press's attention. And really the line was for adults who would be working at office jobs. As we can see, the models and mannequins around the room are all adults. Um, and the photographs on the pegboard, which I know are, uh, are a little difficult to see here, um, they really, they go into Cookman's design process at the Institute, um, which I'll talk about now. Um, at the Institute, she worked with occupational therapist Muriel Zimmerman to observe and measure the clothing problems that patients at Rusk's Institute experienced. Together, they used those graphs and tallies to make what we might call today data-driven decisions, um, though what they called at the time uh, scientifically designed. These graphs come from the appendix of the book that Cookman and Zimmerman co-authored called Functional Fa Fashions for the Physically Handicapped. We can see in these measurements the kinds of categories that they found useful for both clothing and disabilities. We have shoes, slacks, stockings, dresses, neckties, and more generally all types of clothing. Uh, then we have amputee, quadriplegic, cerebral palsy, and more generally um, an unnamed category. Ultimately, Cookman and Zimmerman decided that they would create their pilot line with the needs of uh, quadriplegic persons in mind. So after showing the pilot line to press, um, Cookman received hundreds of inquiries from the public asking how to purchase the garments. Deciding that this could be something a lot bigger, she teamed up with Virginia Pope, the longtime fashion editor for the New York Times, who had just moved to Parade Magazine and who similarly to Cookman had a lot of contacts in the fashion industry. 
They created the Clothing Research and Development Foundation, or CRDF for short, to run their clothing line. And between 1959 and 1960, they published this mail order catalog um, that newspapers around the country began to advertise. Um, so I wanna just dig into some of these designs further. The first is this suit that was playfully called short cut because of the cropped jacket. This shorter suit jacket was to make it more comfortable uh, for wheelchair users because with longer jackets, the fabric tends to bunch up at the lower back and the waist. We know a bit about this model as well. Um, his name was Cy Perkins and he was not disabled. Um, he ran a modeling agency actually uh, for quote unquote normal people. Um, and he offered his services to this project likely for free. Um, that's at least what uh, Helen Cookman alluded to in, in interviews with um, members of the press. Part of this shortcut suit was a pair of trousers that Cookman patented in 1960. And you can see the patent on the far right of this image. These had zippers on each leg that went all the way from the cuff to the wearer's waist um, so that they could be completely separated into two pieces. They also had an interior belt at the waist so that when the wearer needed to use the washroom, they could unzip either the front or the back of the trousers um, and the, the pants therefore would not fall down. This decision was also or this design, sorry, was also made into women's trousers, um, as we see here in the middle of the slide. When someone like Cookman files a patent um, for the trousers that we saw on the previous slide, the patent has to cite earlier patents that are uh, similar in any way. This is a really useful way to kind of track or trace um, particular uh, kinds of, um, or particular elements of designs that we see uh, repeated. So her citations include these two designs, which I find uh, really fascinating. They're both for children's winter clothes to make um, getting uh, dressed and undressed much easier. The one on the left is from 1938 and it has zippers running up and down each leg, as well as an interior belt, um, very similar to Cookman's trousers. And then the one on the right is earlier from 1934 and has zippers down each leg. Um, and I thought it would be fun to show you these as well because uh, of course in Canada, we know how difficult it is to uh, dress and undress, um, especially children in the winter. Um, this uh, suit dress also featured in the functional fashions pamphlet. Um, and they included what Cookman called uh, action pleats, a term that testifies to the goal of, um, of productivity that these garments forwarded. These were inverted pleats, um, as the illustration on the right shows. Before Lycra was widely used in clothing to make it stretchier, um, this pleat style, along with cutting, fabric on the bias would have provided extra stretch and movement so that the jacket would be less restricting, um, particularly for crutch and wheelchair users who would need greater um, arm and shoulder mobility. This jacket also came with uh, reinforced underarms for crutch users and a longer skirt zipper to make it easier to step in and out of. So beginning in the early 1960s, Cookman and Pope approached other designers and brands to incorporate Cookman's accessibility features into their own lines and including a functional fashions label to notify buyers. As you can see, nearly 30 brands did this, ranging in price from expensive pieces with beautiful fabrics from uh, designers such as Pauline Trichere, Vera Maxwell and Lacoste um, to more uh, affordable everyday options like Levi's. This was part of Cookman's goal of getting accessible clothing out of medical supply stores and into department stores. This goal was much easier when brands collaborating with functional fashions 
already had buyers at major department stores. And it also meant that functional fashions were shown at every season um, at New York Fashion Week, or what at the time was called um, New York Press Week. I'll show you a few of the functional fashions designs that resulted from these uh, partnerships. Um, and uh, just to note on the top left of the screen is what the functional fashions label looked like. Um, so shoppers would keep an eye out for this particular label when uh, they were at department stores um, seeking out accessible clothing. Um, the piece that is um, uh, that is seen on two different models here, I think is one of the most important pieces of the functional fashions line. It was called a rugby suit, uh, which designer Vera Maxwell created for functional fashions. And it was called that because the ensemble came with a matching fur lined lap robe for wheelchair users, um, as we can see pictured on the right, um, so that individuals could, um, for example, attend a cold or chilly sports event, such as a rugby match outside. The outer fabric was a blue diagonal wool tweed, and both the jacket and the lap robe were lined with black seal fur. So obviously very expensive uh, for the time and super luxurious. And um, on top of that, the jacket closed with Velcro tabs, um, which you can see at the bottom center of these images where the model is pulling the jacket apart uh, to show the way that it functioned. The matching lap, lap robe also included uh, two front facing pockets so that the contents were easily accessible for the wearer. And the skirt was fitted with trouser hooks, which were thought to be easier than um, small buttons. This uh, dress worn on two different models was designed by Shannon Rogers, um, and it was made of wrinkle resistant silk that was meant to assist wheelchair users um, to wear it throughout the day, especially if they stood up at any point, then they would still look neat. The bow tie was also permanently tied, uh, which made it um, a little bit easier to handle. This strategy of showing clothes on both disabled and non-disabled appearing models um, was also to make the argument, um, which newspaper articles furthered, that these garments were beautiful and convenient for all wearers. So non-disabled wearers were encouraged uh, to purchase these items as well. Um, so I find a lot of my sources on eBay, including this piece, which we just saw pictured. Um, if you take a look at this slide, then I'll go back to those previous images. You can see sort of the, the similarity. Um, and uh, it takes quite a bit of hunting down because often these types of pieces aren't in traditional archives. Um, so I was really thrilled to find this particular piece on eBay. Um, and you can see here the color and the quality of silk that I was talking about. It's quite um, kind of a, a thick and it feels very durable. Uh, it feels like a very durable material. Um, and I, when I purchased it and turned it inside out, I realized that it also had an interior belt um, that's pictured on the right, which I'm guessing was to keep the dress in place and so that it wouldn't inch upwards as the wearer was um, seated in a wheelchair. I also wanted to show quickly that um, functional fashions was advertised and discussed pretty widely in Canadian newspapers. Um, this is the Ottawa Journal in 1965, and the model is wearing a very similar dress to the one that we just saw. Um, and I've, I've also seen newspapers in Edmonton and uh, Nanaimo, British Columbia, with articles on functional fashions. Um, and I'm positive that there are more uh, that are just, that either haven't been digitized or are part of the um, digitized newspaper databases that I've been going through. Um, but it's been really interesting to see the kind of reception that this line received in, in Canada. The functional fashions collaborators also meant uh, that the designs could reach different demographics depending on a brand's target audiences. Um, 
so as you recall, I said earlier in the presentation, the functional fashions line was, uh, the pilot line was primarily for adults. Um, but here we have two designers, Lacoste on the left and Florence Eisman on the right, uh, adding children's wear. The piece on the right by the quite high-end um, designer, uh, children's clothing designer, Florence Eisman, is a matching sailor suit with a lap robe. The shirt um, has a zipper with a large tassel that would have been um, more easily managed by a child and the shirt could unzip entirely as well. Um, and the last uh, collaboration piece that I'll show you um, was uh, this, again, really, really important piece to the functional fashions line. It was made by uh, Levi's in 1974, and it's a pair of, uh, of boot cut jeans. Um, and these jeans came out just after um, Helen Cookman passed away. So she never actually got to see um, the rollout of, of this design. But um, as you can see, uh, this is another variation of her patented trousers. Um, there are some notable differences, though, between her original men and women's suit trousers uh, and these jeans. One is that, um, like the children's wear, this reached a new generation, uh, which was teenagers. Second is that these are denim and thus more casual, and the zipper is made of plastic uh, rather than metal. And third, um, and most important, I think, is that the zipper is no longer hidden by a placket, essentially making the accessibility feature, and thus, I think, the disability more visible. And this was happening right around the same time as the disability civil rights movement. And for example, came on the heels of the um, 1973 Rehabilitation Act in the US. Um, so what have I been doing with all of this research on the functional fashions line? Uh, in 2019, I curated a display at the Milwaukee Art Museum where I was based for several years um, in the 20th and 21st century design galleries. Um, and that display had clothing, uh, video content, um, Cookman's digitized functional fashions books, and ephemera from the collections such as the functional fashions pamphlet and a Levi's magazine advertising the jeans. I also have an article coming out in the academic journal Dress sometime in the next year. Um, and this will be one of my dissertation chapters as well. Um, so, whoops, I uh, forgot that that was animated, sorry about that. Um, I just wanna move on to now the second uh, section of my talk, which is on um, the, the role of home economics departments in developing accessible clothing uh, right around the same time as the functional fashions line. So um, Claris L. Scott was a clothing designer for the Bureau of Home Economics. And I'll speak for a few minutes about how her career paralleled Helen Cookman's in interesting ways. In the same year that Cookman, that Cookman published her co-authored book, Functional Fashions for the Physically Handicapped, um, so that was 1961, Scott published this pamphlet titled Clothes for the Physically a physically handicapped homemaker through the US Department of Agriculture. This pamphlet also mirrors the functional fashions uh, pamphlet both in design and content. So the two designers were conducting studies on disability and dress at almost exactly the same time. And importantly, they were finding similar construction solutions. This slide um, shows the two designers' approaches to extending movement with inverted pleats, or what uh, Cookman had called action pleats. On the left, Scott's version of a blouse with pleating at the back of the wearer's shoulders, and on the right is Cookman's suit dress with pleats um, in the middle of the wearer's upper and lower back for the same purpose. Scott also added these action pleats to a pair of trousers that she designed to allow the user's knees to bend more freely. Um, and here on the left, we 
we see Scott's skirt with a front facing opening with an extra long zipper placket in order to help the user get in and out with greater ease. Um, and on the right, we see Cookman's skirt with very, very similar features. The two designers also thought quite a lot about storage and where pockets should go. Scott uh, came up with the with these chair pockets, for example, one for home use and one for shopping. And she also created these really interesting blouses um, that aren't pictured here, but if you're interested, I can always um, send you images um, with pockets specifically um, placed so that items wouldn't fall out when users bent over at all. Um, and she entirely removed pockets from trousers to add comfort for wheelchair users. Um, Cookman didn't go quite that far, uh, but created the belt, what she called the belt pocket unit, um, as an accessory, which is pictured at the bottom of the screen. Um, and there are some notable differences between the lines, um, one of which is that Scott worked more with elasticized fabric, uh, focusing again on the bending of the knee joint. Um, and on the right, we can see how she gathered the fabric um, at the knee seams to allow the knee to bend more freely. Um, and that on the left, we see the model um, pulling at the fabric to show the, the amount that it stretches. As the title of Scott's pamphlet indicates, closed for the physically handicapped homemaker, she also focused her attention on designs specifically for homemaking work. She created four different kinds of aprons, for example, to reflect the various kinds of duties involved in cooking. The uh, so-called apron for wet lap work is particularly interesting, I think, is it is made of plastic and is akin to kind of a portable wearable cutting board that can easily be wiped down. So Scott was more specifically thinking about the movements that made up the daily routines of disabled homemakers. In this regard, Scott more openly talked about things like perspiration in the pamphlet and how her textile choices accommodated for such factors. Uh, and we can see some of Scott's clothes in action in this digitized video from the Iowa State University archives. Um, in it, a model wears a pair of Scott's elastic trousers and the blouse with action pleats. So. Hopefully this will work and you all can hear the, the audio because the accents from this video are also really lovely. So, so when we get into a longer pant, sometimes this presents problems for people who are sitting in a wheelchair. And I think that Joyce Dye has an excellent idea for uh, something of this nature so that it's not tied around her knee. Yes, uh, this is an elastic gathered onto there. You'll see her use this uh, pant-like garment as she moves her knee. Uh, this uh, elastic uh, allows for shearing of these garments, which gives extra fullness over the knees and, of course, uh, takes it up as she moves. Now, all of the women like pant-like garments. I think most of us do for certain occasions. And this would give a handicapped person uh, a lot of comfort uh, as she uses her body there. Uh, this could be made at home, of course, too. And uh, oftentimes women put the shearing in by elastic threads or uh, the use of elastic in some way. And this is what has been done on this particular garment that Joyce is wearing. Now, if we can see the action pleats that are in the blouse as Joyce gets up <clears throat> and turns around for us. These action pleats are uh, just make a garment wearable for a lot of people, particularly if their shoulders are a little rounded or if they're full in the shoulders. And this gives her three or four more inches of ease across the back as she reaches. You'll also notice that they've been stitched on the edge. You can see a very fine pressing there. Uh, this goes back into shape, and I think the women like this better because the garment looks neat and fitted this way. You'll also notice that the collars on these garments are very flat. There's nothing bulky or to come out and, and cause a distortion there. 
uh, as they lean over. This hugs the body, and they were made this way on purpose so that they would do that. Uh, did everyone hear that okay? Okay, great. I'm getting nods. That's great. Um, <laughs> uh, one final difference between Scott and Cookman's lines that I'd like to draw your attention to was their availability to buyers. On the left is the final uh, paragraph of Scott's pamphlet in which she indicates that prospective wearers of these pieces would have to make them on their own as well as her hope that commercial pattern manufacturers uh, would create patterns for the clothes to make that uh, creation process easier. On the right are measurements, uh, measurement instructions for the functional fashions pamphlet as the garments could be ordered by mail. Availability of designs, I think is another measure of overall accessibility of these designs. Um, and these two pamphlets afford different types of accessibility functional fashions being ready-made, but potentially more expensive. These two different methods of coming to own and use garments indicate the different populations that these designers served. Scott was addressing homemakers who she assumed had significant sewing experience, and Cookman was advertising to men and women who typically had jobs outside of the home. These two different populations are also emphasized in Scott and Cookman's shared background in workwear. For example, Scott designed for women working uh, on farms primarily. She created these designs in 1942 as part of the push to uh, create working clothes for the war effort. While there are nurse uniforms and mechanics uniforms in this publication, the vast majority relate to outdoor labor in, in an agricultural setting. Cookman also designed workwear, and these are two examples from 1948, uh, which are at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. The left is a waitress uniform, and the right is a cook and or waitress uniform. So I use these two examples uh, to make two points. Um, the first being that Scott created what we might call everyday dress for more rural homemakers, and that Cookman created more high fashion garments for uh, primarily city dwelling people. The second is that Cookman and Scott really did have quite parallel careers. They both designed workwear and that led them later to create workwear in the form of accessible clothing. One conclusion that we can make uh, from this is that labor, rehabilitation, disability, and clothing were all really intimately intertwined in the post-war period. In addition to Clarice Scott, another important figure in the accessible clothing design and home economics world was uh, someone named Jacqueline Yep. She was a doctoral student at Iowa State University's Home Economics Department, which was a leading institution in this work. And in 1975, as the functional line was wrapping up, this was a year after the Levi's jeans were published, uh, were, uh, were, um, were promoted, let's say. Um, she was writing her doctoral dissertation on creating a curriculum to better prepare home economists for working with disabled persons and creating accessible clothing. Her belief was that home economists had a specialty in textiles and clothing um, and that they should apply that to disability, but not without uh, learning more about disability first. One part of her curriculum development uh, relates to the photos seen here, and I apologize for the poor quality. I think these are um, just scans that have been uploaded to the university's archives. Part of her methodology was to modify uh, mannequin to dress forms that we see um, on the top half of this slide, um, to modify them to a wearer's particular shape and specifications and proportions and then to make clothes based on that form. Um, so we see the clothes at the bottom of this slide, uh, which were um, meant to be based very specifically on um, individuals with disabilities, their particular bodies. And in 1974, um, Yep also published uh, a pamphlet titled Clothes to Fit Your Needs for the Physically Limited. 
um, which I haven't been able to locate yet, uh, but I'm sure we'll shed light on the specific types of clothing that she developed, particularly in relation to those that Scott and Kirkman created. This particular pamphlet was not published by the US Department of Agriculture, um, like Scott's was, but uh, by Iowa State University. The back of this pamphlet also alludes to another role that home economists took on in relation to accessible clothing to supply community members with the uh, compiled list of designers and manufacturers who created ready-made accessible garments or advice like Scott's um, pamphlet had on how they might go about creating their own accessible garments. This is also evident in publications like What's New in Home Economics economics, which is shown on the right, with an excerpt from a 1964 article that discusses brands such as Fashion Able, which specialized in women's accessible undergarments. Um, and uh, of course, that will come as no surprise that this article um, also featured functional fashions very heavily. One last home economics figure I would like to highlight is uh, Linda Prescura. A student whose 1963 master's thesis shows and describes the results of her study on designing accessible clothing for children. What I like so much about this thesis is that it includes fabric samples. So even though the photos are black and white, we can better picture what the clothing might have looked like on the kids who are pictured. Frescura was measuring the effectiveness of both the design and the materials of her dresses, including how easily the garments could be cleaned if they were soiled, how long it took for the children to get dressed and undressed, and the aesthetics of the clothes on each child. Parents and caregivers both gave feedback, which I think is also really important, as many of the children spent time uh, both at home and in institutional settings. Of note, um, both Yep and Frescura worked with Cookman on their respective projects before Cookman passed away. So that's another connection. Um, another thing that's important about this study is that it shows accessible designs for kid, kids with uh, cognitive and physical disabilities. This is an especially stark contrast to the functional fashions line, which although designed around quadriplegic persons mostly advertised and discussed people with very limited, I would say, physical disabilities. Functional fashions was meant to aid individuals toward living alone and not in institutional settings, though, of course, that excluded uh, lots and lots of people at this time, as it would today. Um, and in this way, home economists were working on designing clothing for populations who were ignored by more uh, mainstream lines, such as uh, functional fashions. Um, so what I'd like to do quickly now is just to um, show you how I'm looking forward to my dissertation um, with uh, two um, quick slides about my other two um, dissertation chapter ideas. Um, so uh, functional fashions and home economics programs will be two dissertation chapters. And the other two will be about um, Lighthouse for the Blind and the history of Velcro uh, respect respectively. Um, so something that I didn't discuss here um, is a case study on a, a place called, or an organization called Lighthouse for the Blind. There are lots of different locations of Lighthouse for the Blind, but the one that I'm most interested in was in New York City. At roughly the same time um, as designers and home economists were working on developing accessible designs, visually impaired people were working in what were called sheltered workshop settings, creating clothing as a means of vocational rehabilitation. So making clothing was just as much a part of this post-war dress and disability history. Um, the two aprons on the left were part of that project, now also at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and were designed by Bonnie Cashin, but made by Lighthouse employees. 
Um, these employees also learned how to make their own clothing um, and had what were called uh, touch and know fashion shows of their own creations, uh, which is seen here on the right. Um, the photo on the right is from 1964, and the aprons are dated earlier to between 1950 and uh, 1955. Um, and then lastly, my fourth dissertation chapter will likely be on the history of Velcro. That, uh, this is the topic that I probably know least about, um, other than that it's very important. Uh, <laughs> Velcro, of course, is vital to histories of disability design and material culture. Um, and here I have up on the screen a home economist holding up her, uh, her 1976 dress design with Velcro tabs at the shoulders on the left. Um, and then on the right, uh, a casual men's shirt with Velcro closures from the functional fashions pilot line. Um, so dated around 20 years earlier. Velcro was invented in 1941 and then became famous for its role in the Apollo moon landing in 1969. Uh, but my guess is that designers such as Kupman made very early use of it for accessible designs, um, as she and others were always looking for easy ways to eschew fastenings, whether or not that was with Lycra or Velcro. Um, and while the history of Lycra has been written about, uh, the history of Velcro has not, so that may be a gap in scholarship. Um, and I will end it there. It looks like we're just at 40, roughly 40 minutes now. So um, yeah, thank you so much everybody for coming here and listening to me uh, chat, about, chat about my research. Thank you so much, Natalie. I'm definitely going to start following you on Instagram. That was superb. Now, if uh, anybody has any questions, you are welcome to come off mic or just add them to the chat and I'd be happy to ask them for you. Um, I think my first question would be, do you think there are any lessons about current accessible culture that we can learn from the experiences that you've been uh, uh, studying about? Um. Well, one, which is kind of uh, an interesting thing might be that, that there were more options in the, in the past than there are now. Um, and I think uh, that may be surprising to, um, to some people, just given that there is this assumption that most, um, <clears throat> that most people have that uh, accessible clothing is just um, something of the very recent past. Um, and um, I guess I look to the home economists as well for um, their work of including um, people who wouldn't potentially be in kind of traditional um, fashion advertisements um, and uh, creating clothing for them. Um, I think that's been really important to me because I just uh, personally also want to make sure that I um, represent uh, different disabilities in my own scholarship. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, current accessibility culture, the one thing that's different, very different now um, from this history is uh, the that idea of disability culture that, that didn't really exist in the same way in, in the past. And um, you get uh, activists and advocates who are talking about radical disability and using clothing towards that end. Um, and you just get like little hints of that in the lines that I was speaking about, but mostly it was about um, Kind of wanting to appear uh, kind of normal, quote unquote. Mm. That's really interesting. I imagine that's uh, can be the case to some measure. Uh, like, or is there anybody in the group here who had to learn to sew for their kids? 
I know I did. That was uh, one big challenge that I had to come from. Uh, thank God for skinny jeans. They were um, my saving grace when it came to finding clothing. But um, I, I see, you see a lot of phases that kind of come come and go in terms of um, parents who, or, or not sorry, department stores who kind of start a line, but you don't necessarily know that it exists. Then you find out later and that it doesn't exist anymore. I, I wonder if, a similar form of advocacy, just just given that fact that this has been a thing um, to, to really see in your work, Natalie, I, I wonder if that's something that we can regenerate at one point or another. I know there's like little pockets of businesses that do amazing stuff and things like that, but it would just be lovely to see in a, in a larger scale. Linda here mentions as well, it appears that there was more excitement in the past for this. I hope your work inspires some current and future designers to consider and impact what they could make. I love that. And Donna, you have a... Yeah, I have a question. Hi, Natalie and my sister Karen's here, it's the whole family. <laughs> but my question is, uh, is this, you know, in, in your exhibition, you did another show, Nat, in um, Milwaukee on the work, of the accessible fashions of Florence Eisman. Mm -hmm. And um, that stuff is really, really high end, like heirloom children's clothing, very expensive, very posh, beautiful. And I wondered if you wanted to say something about this idea that clothing for um you know children and adults with disabilities can be like armor like bill cunningham in the new york times talked about um clothing as armor and um it's so interesting when i think about uh dressing our nicholas when he was little i remember um getting really expensive clothes for him and mm -hmm. blowing the bundle, well, you too, Natalie, I did that for you too, <laughs> because I, I love, you know, fashion, but um, I do remember thinking that I wanted Nicholas as a child with disabilities, visible disabilities to appear aspirational. I wanted other people to look at him and say, oh, you know, look at that kid. I want to be him because of his clothing. And I wonder if you could, you know, talk to that idea a little bit. Yeah. Um, at one point in time, Helen Kirkman says that um, people with disabilities should have even more beautiful clothing than uh, non-disabled people. And I think she's kind of getting at that sentiment. Um, that you were just describing. And there was so much discussion um, about psychology uh, in relation to the line that um, there was a lot of like social anxiety at that period of time. This is kind of like post-war, Cold War time when uh, people were kind of worried about in general, I think, people's mental health um, and uh, you get a lot of discussions in newspapers about um, this type of clothing that's both functional and fashionable. I think that's why they chose those two words that it had to be beautiful and functional. Mm -hmm. That having that combination um, would then really elevate people's mental health. Um, and then, but I guess the, the flip side of that was that it was always like, and then they'll be more productive. Um, so mm. that's kind of the, um, I think that was the discussion that, um, that as you said, that was sort of like that armor element that we can, it was sort of, I guess the equation was like, we can make people feel good with clothing and then they'll be productive citizens when they feel good, I guess. Um, so there was a lot of um, kind of cultural anxiety at that point in time around um, like idleness more generally. Um, so um, 
Yeah, I think that's a really good question. They were just kind of wrapping those things together. That's an interesting tie. I remember seeing kind of earlier on in the pandemic, just a tie between the notion of nostalgia and productivity and how there will definitely be a phase that we see in that as well too. And um, I could see that very much in the same fashion, just given the fact that with the war and transitioning, but also from an adult disability that comes with its own sets of challenges in terms of uh, making that adjustment as well. Uh, Kinga, you have a question. Yeah, and I, I know you showed a lot of different lines and some were you know meant to be luxurious and some were meant you know, for <laughs> labor. Um, I'm wondering if you have, like, did you collect any data about the kind of uptake that those designs had? Like they were obviously very well thought out, right? Like the pockets, the, you know, the fastening thing, the, the fabrics, um, did they work for people wearing them? And, and like, do you have any sense, oh, like this jacket sold, you know, this, you know, you know this many, um, yeah. do you have any, any kind of data about like sort of what the actual uptake was of, of, of these fashions? Yeah, um, that is very hard to get at in the sources. I wish I had a clear answer. Yeah, sorry, that's a hard question. I yeah, uh, I wasn't expecting a great answer. It's a great question though, because it's one that I try to tease out because it um it just in terms of histories of design too, especially when you have patents like this. If you have like patent furniture, then a lot you have a lot of historians' first question will be like, did this ever get made? Was this ever used? Was this just an intellectual project? What, what was this? Um, and with this clothing line, um, it seems like for functional fashions, at least that's the one that I know most about. Um, it seems like the heyday was in the 1960s um, and newspaper articles will, would often say like these are stocked in like over 200 stores or over 300 stores and then it starts to become like more ambiguous in the 1970s where you where they'll say instead like these might be hard to find you may have to contact the clothing research and development foundation for more information on where to find these um and uh, it's also really tricky to find out, um, find answers to those questions when museums and archives don't traditionally have this kind of material in their collections. Um, I mean, some do, like the Levi's jeans, those are in the Levi's archives in San Francisco. They just didn't know that they had those until uh, myself and one other person messaged them with uh, information about them to say like Levi's made these at one point in time have you seen them and then initially they said no and then a year later they got back to us and were like we found them oh, wow. um but those are um another difficulty is that what's in museum collections and archives is typically the examples that were not used so you don't see the alterations that people are making on their clothing because that would get it your question of like, were these actually useful or were people equally finding them frustrating? Mm -hmm. um, because what you really, you, I mean, it would be ideal to have like the original version that's kind of pristine and unchanged and then one with like wear marks and sweat marks and then like the sewing alterations and things like that. Then that would be really great to understand um, how people's bodies actually moved in them. Um, and basically, uh, basically your question of like, were they successful? Um, so yeah, I think it's, um, I think my answer, I guess, would be they were successful for a time and then, but they always had difficulty. Um, like I just, sorry, this, I know this is a long answer. <laughs> uh, there, they had a very, they had a really interesting board for this for the um, Clothing Research and Development Foundation that was made up of uh, basically leaders in the fashion industry at that point in time, like 
the head of Bergdorf Goodman, the head of Macy's, all of these kinds of people. And then uh, they, at one point in time, I know they brought in an advertising agency kind of guru, guru person to try to better connect the designs to people who wanted them and needed them. But the way that they worded it in that newspaper article that I'm remembering just made me think that that was kind of always a problem for the line. Um, and that when Cookman um, and Virginia Pope, the New York Times style editor, when they both passed away and the line kind of ended with them. So. Mm. Thank you. That's, that's a really interesting, uh, it's fascinating to see how this kind of has developed over time. Um, now, Kim has mentioned a comment here. It says, I've been told by professionals that my son's good looks are a real asset for him because of his disability, that he will be, he will be re more readily accepted, I guess, rightly or wrongly. And I think clothes are an extension of that. That's a, that's a very fair point for sure. And Marit has a question. I'm curious if there's any historical scholarship on the impact of design or fashion in creating medical accessories and devices. I'm thinking of the addition of design elements to create visual appeal or beauty in medical or disability devices. Um, that, that is a good question. I, I know less about that, but it would be fascinating if there was um, historical scholarship. The example that comes to mind is the connection between um, uh, corsets and back braces. I've seen some um, connections between those two things. Um, and I know that um, there's a, a master's student at um, my old master's degree program, which specializes in the type of history that I do. Um, and she's working on histories of clothing in the 19th century in relation to corsets and scoliosis. So maybe she might be making that connection between um, corsets and back braces. I'd be really curious about that. But it's a, yeah, that's a great question. I'd love to think more about that. That is very interesting to consider indeed. It's, I'd be curious to see what decades from now people would examine current culture and what that would look like where uh, uh, people adopting animal-shaped backpacks for feeding tubes and things like that. Somebody's going to go, whoa, that was quite something else mm -hmm. down the road and whatnot. Now, thank you so much, Natalie, for all of your insights. This has been an incredibly informative evening. And as we move forward, uh, I just wanted to ask you one last thing. Do you have any um, final insights that you wish to share about, um, about this two parents who are still kind of, are still walking the walk, I guess. Um, for, for parents who are currently, currently parenting disabled kids, things about clothing, what would be a thought that you have learned as, um, um, in terms of the history and, and what that may be kind of timeless, things like that. I don't know. Yeah, um, I guess, I don't know if this would make a difference uh, as, a, as I'm not a parent, but I always find it helpful to see reflections of yourself in the historical record. And I would just say that um, you are not alone in this current moment, that many other parents have done this over time and that um yeah hopefully uh more historical work will reflect that that's so that's a wonderful thought and that, that got me right there personally <laughs> um now thank you everyone for coming this evening and as we mentioned there is the optional added half hour if you would like to sit and talk about this further as we mentioned it is you you're welcome to stick around but there's no pressure to do so as well too and uh if you, you have other things to do this evening thank you for coming we look forward to uh 
having you here next month. And uh, there will be a recording on the Canchild website if you wish to share this evening with or this event with other people as well, too.